Hello, welcome back to the Masonic Roundtable, a weekly program where Masons from around the world get together to talk about Masonic news and opinions in a friendly and social manner. As a reminder, the thoughts and opinions expressed here are solely the opinions of the participants and do not represent any Grand Lodge statements or positions. So make sure you keep your conversations open for the public and on the level. To interact with us, we love seeing you live every Thursday night. The chats are always fun in Facebook and YouTube land. Um, we can't get to every chat, but sometimes your chats may end up on the show. So look forward to that and, you know, keep it PG, maybe PG 13, depending on how Joe's feeling. And then, uh, finally, as always, if you can't catch us live, catch the replay or in your favorite podcasting app, you know, me, I'm John Ruark, past master of the Patriot Lodge number 1957. Next up for his introduction, Robert Johnson. Hey, Robert. Howdy, howdy. Uh, hey. If you hear my dogs, because they're going crazy in the background, but uh, Robert Johnson here, host of the Once Game You podcast, and uh, uh, past master of Waukegan Lodge, current sitting master of Space Novum, and uh, yeah, secretary of things. Good to be nice. with you guys. Secretary, all the things. And next up, Joe Martinez. How's it going? Hello. Hello there. No, I'm not blind. I stared at the eclipse <laughs> and I did not go blind. Yes. Joe Martinez, um, past master of Manassas Lodge, number 182 in Manassas, Virginia, member of lots of other things and stuff. And uh, as always, damn glad to be here. I stared at the, at the eclipse and it made you look better. You did. You did. Awesome. Yeah. Let's uh, thank some patrons because those guys are awesome. Yes. Head over to patreon.com slash the Masonic Roundtable if you want to support the show for another eh, decade, two, three. I mean, I got a, I got another decade in me. What about you? Okay. Yeah. We at least got to make it to 2040. So, oh, we have, yeah, 16 years, 16 yeah. years. But who's counting? So, um, that's fun. We always, uh, we actually had a, a fun chat, a little poll thrown up in the, uh, the Facebook group about some upcoming episodes. So, uh, they got to vote. The patrons got to vote on, uh, what's coming up next so that'll be a fun series i'm looking forward to that but you won't know unless you join patreon so sure. thanks and as always we have to segue into our next favorite topic which of course is tarot card of the week right be right, right joe tarot card of the week It's always a good find from RJ for that audio. I'm fine with five more. <laughs> no, just gonna just gonna loop it for the rest of the show. We almost went rated R. You turned it off like a second too <laughs> quick. Two, there, my so to stream it. Woo, so to stream, not a sponsor, <laughs> but a tasty beverage, nevertheless. All right, so RJ's gonna pull our tarot card or cards of the week. We'll see if we can. Yeah, this week what are, what are we're we going to use um, because, you know, the Eclipse. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, nice. It's a nice box set. It's um, I mean, it's not terribly the cards aren't like the best quality or anything, but the uh, Astrological Tarot book and card deck. Uh, this is a unique deck just in that uh, it tends to uh, blend both traditional astrology with the tarot. And so I think for some people that's like, you can't do that. And other people are like, oh, that makes sense. And, uh, but anyway, mm -hmm. uh, so the card, uh, suits for this actually, uh, instead of the typical stuff, you actually have earth, air, fire, water. Um, and the major arcana are essentially all of the planetary bodies and they're not the classical bodies. Uh, you know, they added in, all of the planets because it was you know it, it makes sense for the uh tarot deck to, to have them uh makes sense question so, dr john question question yeah is pluto a planet in this tarot deck good question we'll answer that right after the poll which is zynga uh boom fire dawn Ooh, fire dawn Dawn. So, it's like fire dawn. Nickname. What is um, it? 
Was that because garden? you had terrible IBS in the morning? Yeah. <laughs> Something it, burned. It, yeah, it's it's um the card itself seems to be they're 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 calling it in their book. Um bop, 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 is sorry. Fire day, fire sun, ah, fire dawn. So it says active, playful, imaginative, inspired, creative, and folly. Fire dawn can represent an active and boisterous youth with fertile imagination. So what does that correspond to in a traditional tarot deck? Me. Uh, you. I mean, it's a Joe Martinez. Some elements of the fool in there. Yeah. A little Some bit. Of the pages, maybe, maybe page of wands. Mm -hmm. I like the yeah, the pages. That I think that's really good. Fiery uh, creativity. That's interesting because that's got a little bit of like cups. Like I'm thinking seven of cup, cups from the imagination side. Mm -hmm. But definitely is a lot of wand spirit in there. That's fun. I like that. That's that's an that's an interesting spin. So let's see what the uh, the major arcana here we is comes with uh, Aries. Um, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, and then you start your traditionals. So Sun, Moon, Mercury, Mars, Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Pisces, Neptune, and Pluto. But oh, look there. So happy. So Uranus. happy. Well, there you go. So um, Astrological Tarot, um, comes with a nice box and book. Um, uh, you probably uh, toss, toss and, the box out. Just keep the book. Yeah, let's let's pause one second. So, Barbara, I do not have that tarot deck. Hint, hint, <laughs> hint, hint. Barbara, well, I, I also do not have that tarot. Deck. Barbara, John Ruark does not have that tarot deck. It's it's a it's a it's it's unique, I guess. By bulk, it, it does it does have a nice little blurb about. Um, uh, the symbolism combining astrology and tarot. They have a nice a write up on that, which I think is a really nice and necessary thing when you're doing something like this. So, speaking yeah. of astrology <laughs> and tarot, we uh, we just announced today for yeah, I guess everybody here is a player in Esoteric on Land. We just announced our next speaker. Which is the the man, the myth, the mason, and the legend when it comes to astrology and tarot, and that is Jimmy Paul Lamb, uh, who's been a guest on our show. Yes, uh, he's our next speaker, Esotericon 2024. Uh, we are not a sponsor; we're just all there, and 100 percent of us end up being there every year. So yeah, check it out. Check it out. Now, I will say, I will say without without breaking any confidentiality rules. This is not going to be a Jamie Paul Lamb that you've ever seen before, necessarily. This is not a lecture per se. This is something entirely different. Um, You're jazzed. It's going to be amazing. Yeah, what it is, I saw the speaker release today. The, the video that was shared said uh, workshop as well. So uh, mm -hmm. that's really exciting. That doesn't sound like a lecture. Well, you know, what's also really all, always really great with um, a workshop is it you're learning. So like you can be your own Jamie Paul Lamb. You know what I'm saying? Which is really great. It's not a practical application. Yeah, this is and this is what's really key. I think a lot of people miss out on this opportunity to learn things for themselves. And uh, by doing this, uh, it, you're just going to broaden your horizon. So I think uh it's worth the ticket price alone to come. I mean, you know what? Do this. Go online and look up a tarot workshop. And if you can find one that's live in person with a published author and somebody you trust, number one, good luck. Yeah. Number two, uh, likely what you'll get is a masterclass type format, and it's mm -hmm. going to cost you a couple hundred bucks. And all you're that's doing true. at that point is accessing videos that are pre recorded. That is true. So, uh, Worth the ticket price alone, if you ask me. It's, it's not a tarot workshop. It's something much, much cooler. Yeah. And Calm you know down, how Jason. much I love tarot. <laughs> oh my God, it's, 
It's cooler than Tiro? What? Uh, it's, <laughs> it's stuff you haven't ever seen before and it's i am loving jason tonight he's just got youthful handsome i did my hair energy tonight like it's just yes. boom i'm digging it bye, bye, uh, fun stuff all right where are we on the agenda here we've we've done tarot card of the week can we uh can we give a shout out to uh our man jordan who just petitioned the lodge Congrats, bro. Woo. Yeah, Welcome to the show, pre bro. Yeah. Keep pre -bro. us, uh, yeah. Keep us up to date on how things go. Please, please do. Yeah, yeah. being awesome. Congrats. Awesome. What are we talking about tonight? I don't even remember. I'm just, uh, I'm just well. Transfixed. We are talking about TikTok. Jason, <laughs> just exuberance tonight. I'm just, I'm, I'm just just loving it. I'm absorbing it. I like it. Feeling it. I like it. I get, I get jazzed when I like go somewhere else and talk about breaking free of my evangelical upbringing, which is literally what happened like an hour ago. So nice. Yeah. Talking yeah. about it, not the actual breaking free. Not, of not it. breaking free. So You're Jason, why don't breaking. you, uh, why don't you share what we did over the past weekend week? Oh man. Week. Like what, what goes on in, in Vegas between two consenting adults? <laughs> no, um, only two. Well, <laughs> if we were, we were on a budget. And part of, of Vegas. Girls. Part of Vegas. And, no. So, uh, so over this past weekend, uh, John and I had the distinct pleasure of going up to meet up with Mike the intern over the weekend. And we Hammy. all got a house on Lake Erie, literally right on Lake Erie in Geneva on the Lake Ohio. And we camped out there with Mike's telescope uh, collection. And we were there in the path of totality for the eclipse that happened on Monday. Yay! It so was fun. ridiculous. <laughs> of course, you show that picture. Yeah, it was. It was, it was super cool. Uh, yeah, those are Hammy's telescopes. Um, he was an excellent host. Uh, we got- My Tesla you know, in the background. Yeah, we got VIP treatment right there. Um, so it was, it was the guys, and I brought my my daughters around as well. Uh, gave them, uh, it got them Girl. out of school. Girls, all the girls, girls. four of them. Yeah, wow. and it was probably... especially great when they argued nonstop for the totality of totality. <laughs> when totality over, they were like, "Wait, what? No, no, what? No, what happens?" <laughs> Yeah, so uh, thanks again to Mike the intern for for hosting. Um, John, do you have any of the uh, the eclipse photos? I'm sure oh. I could find some. You you vamp while I uh, find some of those. Yeah, absolutely. So um, you know this the last solar eclipse that we had in this area was 2017. Um, John actually traveled down to I think South, South Carolina, Carolina. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. with his mom for that one and got to experience totality. I experienced the partial eclipse at work in uh, Northern Virginia. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing that John's always told me is like, you can't, you can't describe totality of a solar eclipse. It is something you have to experience. And um, like being, being there for, for totality, that's a, uh, you know, those are shots that we took. Um, of totality and then right as you know we saw a 360 degree panoramic oh yeah sunset, uh like two minutes till totality um the entire earth just going dark in three seconds and then seeing totality um it's one of the most spiritually profound experiences of my life yeah, I agree. It's uh, you can't explain it, but uh, the pictures never do it justice, right? But you could show this, and you're like, it was ten times more cooler than that picture could ever capture. Yeah, yeah. You, it was a complete panoramic sunset. Colors went wonky. You know, it, it's almost like you were starting to wear polarized sunglasses, even though. Um, yeah. 
just everything was being polarized colors were changing yeah so it's yeah it's it's definitely something that i'm looking forward to uh going out to north dakota in 2044 in montana in 2044 so book your tickets now masonry will be dead but esotericon could <laughs> might still be there Esotericon will still be going. We probably won't be <laughs> per year, and uh, a, lot more, a lot more wheelchair ramp accessible options. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, masonry will be dead, so your calendar should be freed up, guys. Uh, RJ will still be secretary somewhere, um, yep. for sure, at the American Legion or something. Um, yeah, but um, I love that you you referenced. Um, the spiritual profound aspect of it. I think that's absolutely, absolutely awesome. Um, which kind of dovetails nicely before, before we get to the, the part of the show that I'm going to be super excited about. Me too. Uh, yes. Uh, let's talk about how important eclipses were to peoples of the past, right? Um, sure. They show up in many initiatic systems. They show up in many spiritual systems of, uh, of being and things like that. And there's, and I think we've talked about some of these actually um, outside of the whole eclipse thing. I know I have, um, but let's start with uh, one of the oldest cultures, the ancient Chinese. Um, so in ancient Chinese cultures, solar eclipses were believed to be dragons that consumed the sun. Um, Interesting. Yeah. And so the ancient Chinese would bang drums and pots and make loud noises during the eclipse to scare the dragon away and end the eclipse. Cause we're thinking, you know, hundreds and thousands of years ago um, when these ancient cultures had to experience things like this without the science that we now have. Right. Um, but well, we stop you there because the card we showed for the tarot this week was in dragon. fact a, uh, a uh, typical uh, what we would call a, uh, a, a, Asian uh, or a Chinese dragon that was uh, portrayed on the card. And uh, I'm just trying to, yeah, yeah, here you go. So uh, here you go. Well, there you, you can go. see it right there. There are no coincidences. Yeah. With no, nope. yes. Nope. Spot on. So, so yeah. But yeah, go ahead, Jason. Sorry. Jason, <laughs> sorry. And that should be. Uh, no, if you if you think back, especially to agrarian societies, especially like ancient Egypt, um, your entire existence as a civilization was based on the sun. That's why Ra was the god of the sun, and, and ultimately, you know, one of the the higher deities. Um, and so, something like an eclipse would throw everyone into complete panic. Yeah, it's and, it's seen as powerful omens in in egypt where uh it's it's uh associated with apophis um not like the the, the large asteroid that will miss us uh but <laughs> maybe it won't miss us in the 2040s but uh yeah i mean swallowing the sun uh, performing rituals and things so that yeah the event the I women mean, you know we all know that it's not really but you know, but wait, but wait, it was so. Um, and I think we actually talked about this on the show once when we were talking about initiation. So, if we fast forward a couple hundred years, uh, before we get to the Egyptians, we're going to talk about the ancient Mesopotamians. Um, and they actually believed that the solar eclipses were omens, um, and important omens, especially for the king. So, I think we talked about this during. Um, a show about initiation, but there was a initiation ritual known as the ritual of the substitute king. So in ancient Babylon, um, you had a king who ruled and the world revolved around him and, and the health of the nation revolved, re revolved around him. So uh, they believed that the eclipse was a sign of the gods being angry and, or, and it would foretell disaster or that the gods were angry with the king. So what they would actually do is have this ritual. They grab a bum off the street, um, the bummest bum you could find, and they would put him through this ritual and make him the king of ancient Mesopotamia. And he was the king for all intents and purposes. He was oh. the king. And they took the king, the real king, and they hid him away. They put him in rags. Sounds very Saturnalian. Yeah, stinky clothes. And he would go hide away as the eclipse was coming. So when the eclipse came, the real king was protected from the omens of the gods. And this, this bum, um, who was a panhandler, you know, two days before, got to be the king of the nation. 
Now, the minute the eclipse was over, because we know eclipses do not last very long, you know, totality is only a few minutes in time. Um, and I don't know if they told the bum this uh, when they were putting him through the ritual of making him a king. Um, as soon as the eclipse went over, they would ritualistically cut off his head and and then reinstall the king as the leader of the nation. So you got to be king for a good a good day or two, and then uh, you were like ritualistically executed for a day, right? Wow. Yeah, <laughs> that is. I can imagine some of us getting our heads chopped off being grandmaster for a day, but yeah. So, uh, you know, oh, I'm the, waiting for it to happen. Oh, the edicts that could happen. eventually. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, the edicts. Yes. Um, but yeah, sorry. Soda stream. Got to take a sip. Have your list ready of all the edicts. Mm, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's probably got one. He's got a Google Doc. Just boom, boom, boom. I do. Uh, yeah, of course I do. Yes. Oh, don't you? No, I don't, because I'm a realist. But um, but yeah, so <laughs> all all the cultures had um, symbolism around. I mean, going all the way back to Native American cultures, there was lots of symbolism around um, the eclipse and what it meant um, for a lot of Native American tribes uh, or First Nation tribes, as I hear them being called in Canada. I did not know this. Um, First Nation folk. Um, solar eclipses were viewed with reverence and a time of reflection. So it wasn't the scary. Uh, awful thing. It was a time of renewal and reflecting on your life and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't until we get to the ancient Greeks, you know, in the you know early sixth and seventh centuries BCE, where somebody got the bright idea to actually start using science and saying, "Hey, this doesn't have to be a dragon or some god getting his head chopped off, or uh, let's put some science on here and use this magical thing called mathematics." And they started to actually create mathematics around the eclipse. Yes, exactly right. Adam B's on fire today. But yeah, but the uh, first one, I know we talk about him when we talk about geometry. Uh, one of the first Greeks to actually use math to predict the solar eclipse was... Who's that? Who's that? I heard it too, but it wasn't me. Yeah, it's not me. I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, one of the first Greeks to actually predict an eclipse was Thales of Miletus. Um, so the oh, dude who figured out how, you know, pyramids and how far away a boat is from shore, he actually predicted an eclipse in 585 BCE. Um, so, yeah, so we move from pure myth to a little bit of science and we get geometry. Boom. Everybody's a mason and the world goes on. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so one thing that's interesting because, again, we can now predict these. I mean, we've been predicting these pretty consistently with, with math, right, uh, for thousands of years. And and yet, as Jason described, it can also be a spiritual experience, right? So the the balance comes from when you're trying to balance a profound personal and spiritual experience with the actual astrological science behind it as well it can be both that's that's the punchline to the show well, and I, yet sorry what jason go ahead well I was, I was going to say and kind of i so i gave a talk tonight on like science and faith and, and i'm not going to make this a big like religious type of thing but praise know, jesus <laughs> praise jesus um the idea that you know the the architect of the universe puts the rules of the universe into play the fact that we can understand and know these rules can lead us to understanding more and more about the actual architect who put them into place and you know we don't have to see science and faith as a as a kind of mutually exclusive type of thing instead yeah. you know if the architect or god or what have you uses the rules of creation uses science to manifest their power then that in no way shape or form diminishes the power of they that put that into place and so yeah. just because we can understand what is going on with a solar eclipse and we'll we'll get to later 
uh, tonight where people just cannot understand what's happening there. Um, but just because we can understand what is going on with it does not make it any less spiritually significant. Yeah, I think it bears mentioning. There's a Heisenberg quote uh, somewhere that see, I can't remember exactly, but something like... Uh, what we observe is not nature, but nature exposed to our method of questioning. And so when you talk about science in this way, yeah, a lot of people will say what you say. You might even take it a, a step further and say that science is merely a modicum of understanding the unintelligible up to sure. a point, right? Like sure. we still don't know what gravity is. But we know that we can calculate the force. We know that it's a thing because it's observable and we codify it and call it something in our own language. And we, I think we know some of its limits, some exactly. of its characteristics and properties. You're just building a jigsaw puzzle and you haven't discovered all the pieces yet. Yeah. And so this is I think this is a wonderful thing. And, and when we started talking about this, this sort of. Uh, blending of, of the science and the spiritual. Um, it is so wild to me, the sort of just wrong things people yeah. have associated well, with the eclipse Yeah, uh, and eclipses throughout history. I mean, um, I, I won't you know, totally dive in here yet, but just to say that it's interesting to me to note things like how many times have we, let's just say not even solar eclipse related. How many times have we lived through the end of the world guys? Oh, too many to count before or after the rise of the internet, because that's a wildly yeah. different. Number. Uh, I mean, yeah. the, we had the Mayan calendar, right? We had Y2K. Y2K. Yeah. I mean, you know, even, you know, cold war, you know, yep. Height yeah. of the Cold War, Cuban Missile Crisis, drills, 9 11, you know, terrorism, but, everything. Well, I, I'm, before we get to that, I, I really just want to not under not not understate Jason's commentary there because I think that people who make those connections and start to incorporate the two things together where you know there is the what of creation and there is the how of creation and how they they can be synergistic and actually respond to each other and not be diametrically opposed i think that's such a freaking beautiful reinforcing it's such a beautiful correlation if there's make, harmony right you know and it kind of changes your it kind of changes your outlook on life right it's 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 no longer either this or that where so many people live in the world, right? They leave, live on the far sides of everything. And just that, that small act of epiphany of bringing it together, it really does change the way that you view the world around you. And it's freaking beautiful. You know, like there's no other way to say it. I could say it worse, but John will get mad because then we'll get dinged. Um, but yeah, okay. I mean, we'll we just keep interrupting you. That's fine. Um, Nothing's gonna take me off my high today because you were just just giving off good vibes, man. Um, but yeah, no, it, it's, it, energy. It's so freaking amazing when when those when you see people make those correlations, like those around you, and you know maybe some that aren't as super geeky nerdy as as we are. Um, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's breathtaking. Um, so I mean, kudos to all of you who can look past. Yeah, like we're. I'm not gonna lie, we're weird, right? We we have a spiritual bent to us, and we talk about weird stuff on here that gets very thought provoking, esoteric. But like, we know when to stop. <laughs> I think. Do we? There's there's like there is a line somewhere, I believe. Can can I read? Can I read uh, something that we talked about today in the in in our chat? Can yeah, I dive in. It? And let's yeah. dive, let's, let's get a let's get a taste. Let's get a sample of what wow. we're talking about. So when you said, "Do we?" Here you go. <clears throat> All right, this is going to be my best reading ever. I'm so excited. Okay. People saying nothing happened on Eclipse. I'm going to read this the way it's written. People saying nothing happened on Eclipse, but many who watched are reporting headaches, eye pain, 
nausea, vomiting. So wait seven to 10 days to see if there was biological sprayed. People will start getting very sick. I don't know. Just telling what's been posted by people who watched it. Also, was a recall day of on many eclipse glasses. Have you checked your Bibles? In Matt 18, 20, where Jesus said, quote, where two or more are gathered in my name, end quote. Now says where two or three are gathered. I checked mine, and it now says two or three before it says two or more. It's called a Mandela effect, which is something CERN can create. Yes, sounds crazy, but check in. Let me know what your Bible says now. There's several more verses that are now changed as well. And that's the end of the quote. And um, I mean, it's got 27 comments, two shares at the time, multiple people loving the comment, liking and shocked faces. And I'm just sitting here thinking this sounds like somebody's having a stroke bouncing from concept to concept. <laughs> did did they did they state which translation of the Bible they were yeah, using? Yeah. I don't know, man. Don't, don't, bring, like, Greek? don't bring your logic into That's this like, conversation. Greek, James? This is like couldn't read flat Greek? earth, oh. hidden planets, government control, energy and consciousness manipulation, predicting catastrophic events. And like alien and extraterrestrial influences all rolled into one, one thing. And then you just <laughs> look, like, you need to repent. What you is this? Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull? Come on. You need to apologize for lowering my IQ the way you just did. No, I don't. But you know who does? There's a couple guys on TikTok. Oh. Well, so if everyone gets a platform, right? It doesn't take long if you spout and believe your own nonsense long enough that you can start to put these things together and as a dog returns to its own vomit yeah. you can actually get people to follow you just by say spouting nonsense yeah i mean uh, this is the same kind of thing where uh we get momentary popularity uh in the form of views likes maybe a couple merch deals or something and and Maybe there's a small niche or a cadre of people who will back you. And maybe you even reach some sort of, I don't know, like neo uh, quasi like uh, new age status, a uh, guru status or something, right? And people follow you around and you write a book or two. But people who talked this way to... People who talk this way in like live crowds 200 years ago, uh, you know, formed our first cults. And they were idiots. Some of them. There's so many ways I just want to start, but then I stop and then I want to start again. Just go, but just go, wind you up. Man, it's, it's, and we talk about it, and I'm not pooping on on platforms, right? I, I mean, I love the fact that <laughs> I love the fact that people have a vehicle now to share, right? You know, we are in a much different world than we were 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. But when I think what chaps my my butt is when people come from a place of authority or represent themselves as coming from a place of authority. Then you're speaking for a larger group of people that want nothing to do with your bullshit, you know, and, and sorry, John, but it's, that's what, you know, when you start off something by saying, well, I'm a 32nd degree Mason and I did this and this, and then I say 10 minutes of just verbal diarrhea. That's what really bothers me. Yeah. Um, uh, you, know, you, there. you know, cause you're conflating. Hey, so just, just, just like that. Yeah. Getting the weirdness. In. Um, I think it's the TikTok Masons are infiltrating. Got the tinfoil under my hat. I'm good. Okay. Um, so I want to, let's backtrack just a little bit. Where do they go wrong? Uh, because here's, here's, here's my question, right? We all say, Hey, we're all like, let's just say Masons in general. And maybe there are Masons who are on various platforms who are spouting things that are, uh, you know, just 
untrue and they're terrible and uh, idiotic and whatever. I mean, it just, just not trying to be mean, just literal defining what's being said. So um, everybody gets a platform. Okay, cool, free speech, right? And we're all supposed to be in the level as Masons. And we have this thing that we're, we're allowed to be, uh, to correct our less informed brethren and um, kind of like wrapping all that up. And then I, I just do they have that? Like, where's the. Is there a line that that we should draw as Masons to to say, hey, you, you, I mean, you shouldn't do that, or you know, maybe they're just so new and they're so green and they think they know everything, and or maybe they were studying this stuff and became a Mason to become legitimate in some way, shape, or form to be able to say these kind of things to crowds to sort of uh, gain a, a following. I, you know, it is it's very interesting. Well, I mean, to, to your point, I mean, there, there's two there's two points here, and and I think we'll all agree. The first the first thing is, and we we talked about it before, is if you're using Freemasonry to justify the rest of the things that come out of your mouth. Right. Yeah, that's a clear. You're already mm-hmm. we're already losing, right? So because yeah. it doesn't matter the ten minutes of just verbal diarrhea that comes out and weird pictures and all this stuff. It has to do with the fact that you represented yourself as a Freemason, and now you're saying all this ridiculous crap afterwards so everybody's going to associate the authority logical fallacy with freemason exactly um the other thing too that i think really compounds this which i am just grateful sitting in a room with y'all virtually that none of us do this is you add a whole bunch of proselytizing to the things you're going to say and then you say it right so which is kind of the opposite of what we should be doing as Freemasons, right? Like you don't sit there and say, Oh, I'm this kind of Mason or that kind of Mason. And I love Jesus. And now listen to all the shit I have to say, right? That's two bad things happening right at the beginning. And then everybody who is online, who is catching those 30 seconds or 60 seconds of what you're going to say is going to associate with Freemasonry. And that's the two biggest problems I see is that this conflating Freemasonry with just wacky, wacky crap and proselytizing at the same time. So Freemasons shouldn't have an opinion then that we should not be publicly sharing our views. One should not presume to speak for all of Freemasonry. Yeah. And they should, they should write that down. Something or they should, they should have some sort of a caveat at the beginning of their you know, podcast every yeah. week. Yeah. <laughs> so let me ask this, right? This is something I think that we have uh, embodied in the entire time we've done a podcast, something that I've done on WCY from day one. And this is always to say, in my view, or to say, I'm going to read this paper uh, from the viewpoint of this person. I'm not going to censor what they said. We can talk about it afterward in the context of the day kind of thing. Right. But something that we've always done, and I think that Freemasons who have an audience, um, they will speak about things as historically and uh, contextually honest as possible. I like the way you put that, intellectually honest, right? When, yeah. When you so, put that caveat in just to limit the bias, Yep. that's, so that's if, a good thing. If I want to say... Hey, I'm Robert Johnson. I'm a 32nd degree Mason. And um, I believe that the solar eclipse is actually going to obscure the planet Nibiru, uh, planet X. And um, they don't want you to look up because if you don't, you know, if you look up, then you'll be able to actually see the planet that's going to collide with it. You know, don't look up kind of thing. And so you say, no, you can't say that. What you can say is, Hey, I'm Robert Johnson. I'm a 32nd degree Mason. I read something online where I was totally fascinated by this idea that seems to be just wild and crazy. What do you guys think about it? I mean, it sounds like really crazy to me. What do you think that comes from? You know, open up a larger conversation about something, but that's not what a lot of guys do. Well, it's there's a fine line, be, you know, because at, at the beginning of the show, you know, we go around and we say, hey, I'm Jason Richards. I'm a past master of Acacia Lodge number 16 in Clifton, Virginia. Why, why do we do that? 
we're on a podcast on Freemasonry and it makes sense for us to have some bona fides to have been involved in leadership within the organization about which we are talking. But there's a big difference between, you know, establishing those bona fides and saying, hey, I'm a Freemason because of that. You should listen to what I have to say, which I, I think is not something any of us have have ever done on the show. As, as Scott says, it's a relevant qualification. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Not a leading one. Right. But we don't, right. We don't, I mean, in, in the, I mean, even before I was on here, when I was watching you guys for years and years, I never saw you use your Freemasonry to promote a particular agenda. Right. And, and I think that's what's happening here. And we have to call them agendas, right? Because for a lot of these people, some which I will watch just to get myself riled up, right? Like I don't even enjoy them anymore. I sit there and I watch and I get mad and I kick my dog and she flies across the room. And then I, I <laughs> he does fly. not kick his dog. Uh, and my then dog. He, you know what he does? He hops into our group chat and he rants. Oh, and then we're all we're all there for it. Calm down. We Joe. all suffer because Using language that is not PMR appropriate. Yes, non PMR appropriate language. <laughs> As you guys have never, gals have never heard of, but um, but yeah, it's it's just all agenda pushing, right? And it's not, it's uninformed, it's it's the the vapid scholarship that of, of today, right? It's like I read something, I didn't even read the whole damn sentence, but now I'm going to speak about it because I've now read it and it's part of my brain. Um, <laughs> that's scholarship nowadays. Basic ethos is about establishing credibility on the topic you're to address. Nobody says I'm a cardiologist, so believe me on gardening. 100% agree with that. Yeah. Or as my good friend Spencer Hammond would say, Hundo P. <laughs> uh, so, okay, when I started doing uh, some tarot card stuff on the WCY podcast at the end of the show for some contemplative exercises, I thought, yeah, this is fun. You know, I did get a couple guys from some interesting places, you know, in the more southern uh, kind of Bible Belt area who felt it was an inappropriate addition to the podcast because uh, people, quote unquote, already think masonry is weird. And I thought, well, you know, I tried I give a big disclaimer at the beginning of this and say, hey, these two things are not in any way uh together and you know for me they are tools that i can use together they might be for some other people but you see what i mean like you're being honest about things right. um yeah, and, we've gotten flack for tarot card of the week yeah i know we've summarily ignored and dismissed it <laughs> yeah i i have i'm you i'm bad i try to engage it, it, we're enabling your addiction civilly, Jason. I, I try to engage civilly in a conversation and then if I can't, uh, then I'll tell these four gentlemen, these three gentlemen about the uh, the issue. And then and then Jason is like, why do you even do that? Just ban them. Just delete the email. It's not worth it. <laughs> I so I know myself. You do. Yeah, you know. And I prize my mental health enough. Yeah. <laughs> cut it off and go, no. <laughs> You're not going to win. <laughs> I'm the opposite. I think I get stronger when I absorb like the, the sadness of my enemies. Like I absorb it and I become a stronger individual. You know, and yeah, I'm always sure. the guy so, that's like hey, after the, the lamentation of the women. <laughs> but I, I also look at it too. <laughs> it's like enemies. The, uh, like the the point zero one percent of people that complain, right, do not represent the totality or the gestalt of the general listener, right? So they are not the totality of the eclipse. <laughs> It's a parcel room. eclipse. Yeah. Uh, but so that all being said, like we as Freemasons do have like sun and moon symbolism though. Yeah. Right. I mean, we, we do clearly have that on our, our deacon stabs. Right. We Eight. have, we have the sun in the East. Right? We have the moon in the West. And I dare say rules the day and the moon which governs the night right except in the case of a solar eclipse right yeah the moon gets an extra three to four minutes and i, and I think it's interesting so i'm pulling from uh our, our friend brother Mackie with his encyclopedia the wet blanket of freemasonry he uh he also adds that um 
The sun is a symbol of authority, where it explains the reference to the master, that it enables us to amplify its meaning and apply to the three sources of authority in the lodge, and accounts for the respective positions of the officers wielding this authority. The master, therefore, in the east is a symbol of the rising sun, the junior warden in the south of the meridian sun, and the senior warden in the west of the setting sun. So, in the mysteries of India, the chief officers were placed in the east, the west, and the south, respectively, and thus represent Brahma, or the rising, Vishnu, or the setting, and Shiva, or the meridian sun. And in the Druidical rites, the archdruid, seated in the east, was assisted by two other officers, the one in the west representing the moon, and the other in the south representing the meridian sun. So... It's often uh, you know, kind of glazed over when we are in our lodges and people start talking about uh, solar symbolism within the, within the Masonic Lodge. Now, aside from those two instances, sun and the moon and the symbolism that is sort of, I guess, uh, I don't know, what do you call it like when you make it real, like in real life? Not anthropomorphizing, but like, I don't know. You're like using a real thing to represent something else. And mm -hmm. Anyway, archetype. But it's like a metaphor. Yeah, 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 yeah. There you go. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, so, like, we have those in Lodge. But, you know, I'm also hearing much of the time people will talk about how each chair of the Lodge represents, you know, some part of the classical planets or how the, uh, the senior deacon only travels clockwise uh, in the direction that the sun takes or something. And then the moon will only is the only officer who moves counterclockwise, something, something, something. Have you guys experienced some of this in, in your, in your Masonic travels and in research and readings? So, um, <clears throat> I am working on a new presentation that may or may not happen at Esotericon. Um, that, that, focuses on the, you know, the occult, you know, philosophy and symbology as uh, partially as it relates to Freemasonry. And so when you look at the sun and the moon from the eyes of, you know, middle, you know, the middle ages, you know, alchemists and, and occultists, um, you know, what they thought about those two celestial bodies translates much to the Masonic experience, especially um, especially the parts of the degree where, you know, the lodge may be in darkness, vice when it may be in light, and how the officers associated with the sun and the moon act, um, you know, based on, based on whether the lodge is in, in light or in darkness. And, I know I'm being obtuse and vague. Um, you should go on TikTok. Yeah, yeah, what are you, Arthur Stop Edward Waite? <laughs> yeah, what are you, yourself. Eliphas Levi? <laughs> yeah, what are you, Charlie All that matters is I'm not Samuel Pritchard. <laughs> uh, so, what are you, Pico de Mirandola? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I like Pico de Gallo. Me too. That sounds delicious. Yeah, I mean... Of course, yeah, Jamie Paul Lamb did uh, write quite a bit on the astrological alignment of uh, officers, the lodge itself, etc. I love Jamie, but kind of I'm going to tell you, man, uh, I just feel like that. Which book did he just do? This the liberal arts and sciences one. Uh, okay. That was the middle chamber. Middle chamber. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. That was a book that yeah, I thought that's John got held That's up. this one. Yep, that's the one. Yeah. approaching the middle chamber yeah I th it's um i love you jamie i don't expect you to write simple right i think it's a really good intellectual read <laughs> but um i feel like it's a book you gotta you gotta kind of believe in stuff you've got it, to gnaw through it yeah I, well I, I will say Saber. this and i think it's for those that have met brother Jamie and have heard him <laughs> yeah. not, not give a program, just talk conversationally. If you can read it in Jamie Paul land language, it, it flows, right? It's like, Oh, this is what he's saying. And this is how he's saying it. And I'm going to read at the speed that he speaks. 
and then it'll come to me. Um, but yeah, if you're just like an audio book version, we do need an audio book. Sure. Yeah. How cool would that be? Yeah. Let's Can I that. get Jamie Paul lamb to read it? Yeah. That's then, what but, I'm thinking. But I think yeah. it would be better if he read it and then like just went off on weird tangents and because oh, that reminds oh, me yeah. of this other thing and just phew, takes off. Yeah. It's, it's a good book. You should guys yeah. check it out for sure. Uh, we actually gave it out to, it was the book that we used for our foundation uh, just two years ago at Space Novum for our, we did the seven liberal arts and sciences for the year was our main uh, piece. And that was the quote unquote textbook for the year. So we had Jamie come out, did a great presentation for us to kick us off with uh, the, the, the trivium and um then we 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 went through the whole thing. We had mathematicians come out and talk about stuff, and we even gave our experts in mathematics and things copies of Jamie's book. So uh, it was a really good time. Highly, I do recommend the book. All right, final question time. Okay. Ooh, uh, eclipse. I want to complain some more. Okay. The eclipse, science, page. spirituality, or something else. I wasn't listening. What was the question? I again? know you weren't. So uh, the eclipse, science, spirituality, or something else. Let's go. Uh, let's go to Joe since you know you missed the eclipse. Yeah, I did. I caught. I caught about eighty nine percent totality. Um, so we did watch it. Not the same. It is not the same. I'm super bummed. We have much FOMO. Fail. Um, I know. I'm sorry. So to answer your question, absolutely a thousand percent both. Um. It gives you a unique way to look at the world that you don't get to see very often. And, and in that viewing of the world, you know, it can definitely tell you things about yourself. Um, and I'm just trying to be very lightweight with my comments because I don't want to speak for, for the two bros here who got to see totality because uh, it looked breathtaking. But it's absolutely a more profound experience and looking at it from a purely scientific point of view. So, you know, uh, you are blessed if you got to see it and experience that. Um, yeah. And, uh, 2044, we'll be there. Let's do it. All right. Uh, Robert. Bye-bye. Well, we watched it here from Illinois. Um, we didn't travel to South. No, we, we got everything except for like just a sliver uh, on the far side. Uh, and we watched it through my solar filter. Um, it was it was really magnificent. I think I don't know that it's spiritual for me, but maybe it's kind of a a different kind of spiritual in that it is the perhaps one time that you can really feel the size of the plane that we live on, if that makes sense. Like you, the, the size of the solar system, the size of the universe, the size of our little corner. Um, not even a corner, right? So <laughs> our little, our little teeny spot. And when we contemplate like to, to science, you know, scientifically understand exactly what's happening, how far this stuff is, it's almost uh, in its own realm for me, you know, sort of a magnificence, awe and splendor. You know, you look at art deco, type of uh, design and everything is so huge and designed to make you feel like small and there's the titans right and it's like that's this moment playing out on this huge grand scale and you just gotta think like how lucky are we and so that's yep. for me And uh, before I, I hand it back, I, I do have to say, get registered for the Midwest Conference of Masonic Education. And uh, for those of you in Richmond, Virginia, I'll see you Saturday. Ooh. 
Nice. Jason. Eclipse, uh, science or spiritual? Why do we need to draw the distinction? Say more. Because John said so. Okay. Um, if if we view science through the lens of the the constructs of reality put into place by the Creator God, um, whom all Freemasons believe in, or or all all Freemason obediences that um, require belief in the supreme being or a higher power as um, you know a membership requirement. Um, if you believe that God is the creator of all things and put into place all of the scientific constructs that, that we are able to use today, um, then manifestation of creation and observing that manifestation through science um, implies an inherent marriage between spirituality and science, which I don't see as a bad thing nice love it very different yeah. than a marriage between religion and science yeah. i'll make that clear it is very very different than that yeah good call good call yeah so uh again this is my second moment in totality and i also look forward to seeing it another 20 years uh you, know, you got to catch them all. And I'm, you know, I'm even thinking like, okay, well, I know it happens again in August of this year, uh, somewhere in like the Southern hemisphere. Can I, can I book a trip now and fly down there? So like, it's, it's that cool. Um, it is not to be, you know, overdrawn and, and over dramatic about it, but it is, it is life-changing. And it's, it's something again, that you, you can't describe. They say, uh, the best quote is that being in totality is like falling in love. You can describe it, but it's not the same as being in it. And um, yeah, again, it's just a natural phenomenon that we can now predict at a regular schedule down to the minute. And yet the natural experience the, of being in something that is, is an alignment, that it is you are in the shadow uh, of, the, of the moon, it's, there, there is something unique, different, special about it. Um, that is something that is not a regular occurrence. And so that alone makes it uh, a rare instance or something one, one to be savored. And then something greater than that, when you think about how, you know, our whole universe had to align uh, to make that happen. Like that is, that's something bigger than ourselves and at least puts us in our place. So um, when you look at it from a macro to micro scale, that's certainly how I like to see it, that uh, it, it is special in that, that way. And, and it, you know, it, it kind of puts things in perspective. So it, if it doesn't give you thought, if it doesn't give you pause as to existence, then I really think you know, it's worth you re-examining what, what your priorities are. Um, but it's also a really cool trick of the sky too, if that's all you want to treat it as. But for me, it is something more and something I look forward to. And I'm glad I got to share it, uh, with, uh, with my family as well. And so, um, that's it. And so what I want to do is end with a little bit of a musical number on our way out before we go to our closing thing. So let me see if I can get the audio to work. I'll get a thumbs up from, from Jason if, I, if the audio works. All right. So let's, we're going to try it. We're going to try something new, uh, but it's, it's definitely worth sharing. Let's go. In the shadows they gather, hidden from our sight A clandestine order, cloaked in the night Symbols and rituals A conspiracy untold Power and control, secrets they withhold Eyes watching closely, always in control Masters of deception Architects of the soul, their influence pervasive, hidden in plain sight. Behind closed doors they plot, shifting in the light. Freemasons rising, ruling from the 
dark mystery.